the Kennedy Space Center Visitor Complex in Cape Canaveral. The Mission to Mars, one of the exciting exhibits that you will find here. We bring you Rocket Talk alongside John Coward. I'm Bernie Gunther, so glad to have you with us. This building really sums it all up. This really is the mission right now of NASA, obviously getting back to the moon first, but obviously right. the road to Mars is what it's all about. Uh, we love the thought of going to Mars. I, I tell you, if you talk to any NASA employee, we would tell you right up front, uh, we want to go to Mars. We've been thinking about it since 1987. For NASA, for, for all life on Earth, what is it about Mars that makes it so exciting? Mars is, is probably one of the most Earth-like planets there is in the inner solar system. You also have Venus, but Venus is a little bit tougher and, and we think we can learn more from Mars. The coolest things about Mars is the biggest volcano in the solar system is located on Mars, Olympus Mons. It dwarfs anything that we have here on Earth. It's bigger than Mount Everest. And a Grand Canyon, our Grand Canyon would Two or three of them would fit inside the Grand Canyon on Mars. So there's some exciting things to go see. Hopefully we can, can go learn what happened to Mars and then that plays back to us here on Earth. What may happen to us someday? How did that happen to Mars? And we've obviously been exploring the red planet for, for a number of years, but what would it be like to actually get actual humans in their footsteps on Mars? Uh, that, that's a dream I've had since I joined NASA, I can tell you that. Uh, I, I oftentimes will, will take a presentation that I have and, and one of the early rovers took a picture of a sunset on Mars and I just imagine four or five human beings standing there watching that sunset on Mars, what, what that would have to be like. Uh, obviously this is going to be a moment that we're going to see in the next decade plus that uh, is going to be life changing just like it was when we saw those first footsteps on the moon. Oh yeah, I, can you, like I tell people, uh, the greatest events in human space exploration haven't happened yet. When that happens, that's going to be one of them when you set foot on another planet. And going to Mars is, is completely different than going to the moon. When you went to the moon, that was a, a three day camping trip. When you go to Mars, that's a two and a half year commitment with three or four of your very best friends because you're not going to be away from them. Well, let's talk about the, the road to Mars. And we have a couple of different players that are involved, obviously, in the process of getting there. You see right around this building, the, the SLS, that looks like that's going to be the real carrying point to get a lot of people up there. That's our plan right now. The SLS is going to carry up. It's got three different configurations. Uh, you'll recognize twin solid rocket boosters on the side of it. These are larger than the old shuttle solid rocket boosters. Those were four segments. These are five, a little bit bigger, a little more thrust, a little more oomph. And then on the bottom, it's having well, on the Saturn V, you had those big F1 engines. We're just going to put four of the old space shuttle main engines. Uh, but they've been upgraded. They're going to generate a little bit more thrust. So when this thing lifts off around here, you're going to feel it in this general area. Um, but that's supposed to be the one in these various configurations that's going to carry our, our big spacecraft that have to go to Mars. And, and there's still debate on the right architecture to go do that, but this rocket could get it done no matter which architecture we choose. Well, as far as the capsules are concerned, that's obviously one of the other big differences. When you're talking to look at the, yeah. the CCP program, yeah. the Dragon, uh, what Boeing has with the, the Starliner, Starliner, you know, both of those much smaller vessels oh, than yeah. the Orion. Yeah, the Orion is designed to take you out into deep space. The other capsules are for low Earth orbit. Once you get out of low Earth orbit, you're in a very ugly radiation environment. Uh, obviously, you need more supplies. You're going to be gone a little bit longer, that sort of thing. So the Orion is designed to keep people safe and carry them out there beyond the moon if they have to. What do we imagine that, that journey will be like for the, the lucky few astronauts that are going to make that first journey to Mars? What is it going to be like in the Orion? Oh, I, like I was saying, when, when you go to Mars, uh, it's six months just to get there. That's a long time. And then because of orbital mechanics, celestial mechanics, uh, you're going to stay for a year and a half, and then you spend another six months getting home. Uh, it's going to be one of the most fabulous journeys ever. Uh, it's been a long time since anybody went out and looked at the Earth from that far away. Uh, I, all the astronauts want to go do it. In fact, uh, recently I, I gave a tour to the, the most recent astronaut class, and uh, they all they all want to go to Mars. <laughs> Why not? Yeah. And you take a look at the partners that are involved in the CCP program, and Boeing is right there, and they're a huge partner with you guys here on the SLS. Uh, they are. They are the guys uh, that are building the actual SLS, the, the core rocket stage. And it, once again, very, very difficult thing you gotta do. You're going back to a Saturn V class vehicle. These things are huge and just the, the mechanics and the structures and, and the way this thing's got, it, it's an amazing thing that they're doing for us. And, and the Orion on top that they're working on, 
just an amazing story. And where's the SLS being built right now? Uh, right now being done uh, down in Michoud, uh, in near New Orleans, Louisiana. So uh, that, that's where we've traditionally done these big, big pieces for our rockets. And then of course, that rocket will then get moved over here to, to Cape Canaveral. When do you expect right. that some of that may start to come into come to fruition? There are actually some pieces that are starting to arrive already. Wow. But the but the big components, the ones that you'll recognize as a as what looks like a first stage and those are they'll start arriving probably in about a year from now. Uh, we want to have a, a launch. I think it's in 2021. Is, uh, is when we're going to send up an Orion capsule. So very soon and we've got the the vehicle assembly building out here when you come to the Kennedy Space Center you can come see the one of the biggest buildings in the world by volume um, we've uh, put all the platforms together in there and we're checking it out right now get that thing ready so that when we're ready to start stacking that rocket the building's ready we can go do it well, that's what's amazing as you think about uh, that building that was built generations ago is ready for the SLS yes it is uh, it's stood up very well over the years, been through a couple of hurricanes, that sort of thing. We've replaced a few panels on it, but really uh, the building is, is an, a marvel of engineering and, and it adapts well even to this day. You know, we built it, like you said, back in the 1960s and it still works for us. You take a look at the, the launch pad for the SLS. I've, I'm assuming that's something that has to be upgraded as well out here at Kennedy Space Center. Yeah, we took the old pad 39B and, and for the folks who remember the shuttle program, we had a fixed service structure and a rotating service structure. Those have been cleaned away and now we have what we call the clean pad concept. You're basically going to take a, a SLS on top of a mobile launch platform that's got a service tower already built onto it and you carry all that out to the launch pad. Launch pad's just about ready also. So well, we just need a rocket. <laughs> and a couple other players are also building a rocket similar to the SLS. You take a look at what SpaceX is doing with the CCP program, and, and they're involved as well with the, their BFR, their big rocket. <laughs> Falcon rocket. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they, uh, they're working on that. Now, that's not going to fly for commercial crew, but that's Elon's way of making a heavy lifter. And he's got grand plans for that, and he's talking about flying that in 2021. Um, Love Elon to death, but he is very, very aggressive in his scheduling. I, I can't imagine he'll get there, but he will try. And and what is it uh, about just the, the mock-up of this this BFR that excites you? Uh, just the size of it. Uh, anytime you build these things on this grand scale and the lifting capability these things have, it's just incredible to imagine that you can get this much stuff off the ground and then get it all to at least 17,500 miles per hour to go into low Earth orbit. And if you want to go anywhere beyond, well, we're talking about 25,000 miles per hour. So. Well, we always hear a lot about SpaceX, Boeing, ULA, but uh, another big player, Blue Origin, they're about to really start to get their foothold here in Kennedy Space Center as well. They are, and, and so the folks who come to KSC to visit, as you come in the main gate now, you'll pass right by the Blue Origin building, and you will see how big this building is that's dedicated to building their one rocket, the new Glenn. So you'll get a sense of scale. Just coming to visit, you will see uh, kind of some idea of how big this thing is going to be. And what for you is unique about their approach they are very methodic uh, they don't they don't tout it they're, they're not out there in the media with it a whole lot of the time they're just a, their their motto, motto is a gratitum ferociter which means ferociously but slowly um, that's my liberal interpretation of a Latin phrase and that is just the way they're going about their business just very methodical very slowly and mr. Bezos doesn't seem to care what the the schedule is he's going to get it done the right way over time but I get the feeling that uh, when they do launch their rocket, it's going to be spectacular. Again, another one of those big rockets we're talking about that really rattles the windows around here. It's going to be another one. So if we get SLS, we get the new Glenn, and we get the BFR all flying out of here, it's going to be a loud place to live, I think, for a while. And you take a look at the difference, obviously, from what was previous with Saturn and Shuttle. How exciting is it for you to have a couple of different options trying to get to that the same destination. Well, that's the grand thing. I, we may actually be in kind of a golden age of space right now. You don't really know when you're in a golden age, but but I suspect it could be happening with all these private developments along with SLS, our plans to go to Mars. We're going out to Europa, might go visit Titan. We're sending lots of stuff to Mars. It's a very busy time. And just to have all this going on, for a, for a space lover like me, it's a dream come true. <laughs> well, it, well, it may take a, a couple of years before you and I have a chance to go to Mars. You can go right here to the Kennedy Space Center Visitor Complex and get a glimpse of what it's like. Savannah Collins has more. 
I'm Savannah Collins at the Kennedy Space Center Visitor Complex outside the Journey to Mars Explorers Wanted Exhibit. Inside, you can learn about how NASA is going to send man further than they have ever been before to step foot on the red planet. Let's go explore. Welcome to Explorers Wanted. Here you can see what's happening today at NASA. Explorers Wanted is talking about our new future of going back to space. And right now we're inviting children and grown-ups to come join our space program. NASA has a lot of plans for us in the space program. We work a lot of different things, from NOAA covering um, climate and weather, to an underwater laboratory off the coast of Key Largo, to going into deep space again. Right now, we have not been into deep space since 1972. We've been launching satellites for years and checking Mars out and the other planets. So we are hoping to actually take humans to Mars, the farthest we've ever been. I love doing this show. I've been doing this show for years. The crowds are amazing, everywhere from children to people my age, to people from internationally all over the world that are fascinated by our space program, and you should see their faces. We have some beautiful displays here. We can tell you about Apollo, Mercury, Gemini, the shuttle program. Journey to Mars is talking about our future. This is the future of everybody's kids. This is really inspiring a whole generation of workers. This is a whole new field that's coming up to give work to everybody all over the world. A lot of kids show up here and they want to talk about being an astronaut. And I get the opportunity to tell them about all the jobs at NASA. It's just not engineers and astronauts. Construction workers, welders, wildlife. We have a wildlife refuge. Doctors, lawyers, dietitians. So there are so many different jobs that will involve you in the space program. And I like for kids to realize that not everybody's an astronaut or engineer, and you could still come work with us and enjoy that program. Come and experience the future of space travel yourself at the Kennedy Space Center Visitor Complex, where explorers are wanted. Well, John, what a great look from Savannah. All this you can experience right here at Kennedy Space Center Visitor Complex. Mars is, is just so cool. I think Mars is so cool, the license plate on my truck is Go To Mars. I've had that since 1995 around here. The thing that people don't realize about Mars is it wasn't until 1964 that we could definitively say there were no canals on Mars. Until then, there was this hope that maybe there might be life on Mars and they had canals that were bringing water down from the poles to feed their civilization. We finally flew by and they go, well, it looks more like the moon than it does the Earth. So 1964, 1976, we, we land with a Viking lander uh, there on Mars and we get that very first picture back and, and it's confirmed. It is just mostly a barren desert looking uh, out there on Mars, but like I said before, we, we've got big old uh, volcanoes, um, all these things that, that, that show at one time Mars was very, very active, and now it's not. Uh, and then we've sent all these rovers. We started with the Sojourner, a uh, little one about the size of a little bit bigger than a toaster oven. Then we got a little bit bigger with the Spirit and Opportunity. And those, all of these survived long beyond what they were supposed to start out with. And now we have Curiosity, which is up there. And everybody knows Curiosity, Curiosity is as big as a car. And we're going to be sending another car size one in Mars 2020. Uh, only this one, to be really cool, is going to have a helicopter on it that'll get up, fly around, and scout out the places to go, whereas with the rovers we've had so far, which is what can I see from the horizon, pick that up. Now we're going to fly up above it, look, and say, hey, actually, that looks like a good place to go to over there. There are so many, and we had Mars InSight land this year. There are seven active probes on and around Mars right now, sending us back data. We are getting ready to go to Mars, finally. <laughs> And I would assume that having all these rovers up there, that's going to be a huge asset to when the SLS finally embarks on its journey. Well, that's it. They're going, like I said, they are scouting. They got to find the right place for us to go. We want to go to the most interesting places with some amount of safety involved. Right. We don't want to land in the middle of the uh, the Grand Canyon 
uh, on Mars, uh, but we might want to go nearby there. We'll see. Mars, these robot scouts, as we like to call them, are out there paving the way for us. They are essential uh, in order to make us have a safe human landing someday. And there's got to be teams of people looking at that data. Uh, what is that experience like? Uh, who, who's looking at that data every day? Oh, th there are tons of people, doctors, uh, PhDs, you know, really, really smart people. Look at figure out where's the best place to go. Uh, folks out at JPL, uh, the folks in Houston who are eventually going to let the humans land, you know, that kind of stuff. So, everybody, there's a lot of people looking at it to make sure that we've got the right data and that we can go to the right places. Now, everybody's seen the movie The Martian, <laughs> um, and and so and there's a dust storm. Dust storms do happen on Mars. Um, Andy Weir once said the only thing in that book that couldn't have really happened was that initial dust storm that was so bad that it blew everything down. A, a 200 mile an hour wind on Mars feels not very strong because the atmosphere is so thin. But they do have dust storms that can play havoc with uh, your solar rays like it has with uh, the Opportunity rover. Uh, we kind of lost it because there was a big dust storm that came up and engulfed the entire planet and probably covered its solar rays up and now we may not get Opportunity back. All these are things you have to think of. Design of a Mars mission is incredibly difficult, especially when you look at the time slots. Like I've said, six months to get there, a year and a half there, thanks to celestial mechanics. Mars, believe it or not, is the hardest planet to get to from Earth. Venus is a lot easier. Jupiter would be a lot easier, although you'll never land on Jupiter. Uh, but because we only intersect each other once every 26 months, that's the longest period uh, in any of the, the celestial mechanics we have in our solar system. But obviously the rover is making a huge impact on our mission to Mars. Let's take a look at the history of the rovers that have already gone to the red planet. Well, with that great history, all the rovers out there, the question is, who's going to get there first? You got SLS, you got Boeing helping that, you got SpaceX, you got obviously Blue Origin. Boy, 
So I have I have spent my life immersed in all of this, and uh, and this is this is a call Alex Trebek couldn't make. Yeah, um, it's so tough. All of the competitors are good. Uh, SLS that design's coming around. We've been working on it for a long time. It's it's designed for success with SpaceX and their VFR, and then Blue Origin with their new blend. I mean, honestly, to try and make a call, who's going to win? That's that's really really. Tough. I could go out there on a limb and and, and make a. Uh, guess don't know that that would serve anybody's better purpose I, I would tell you so to be philosophical about it uh, the winner is us uh, that people are trying competition brings out the best in everybody and and these three groups all want to be the first I guarantee it uh, nobody wants to be the second one um, but but they're going to do it safely. Everybody knows that is the most important thing uh, I used to have a launch director who would uh, tell me John Ten years from now, nobody's going to remember that you were a year late, but they will remember if you failed. So each one of these groups know what's at stake here, how hard it is to go do. It, again, it's trite to say Mars is hard. Mars is really, really hard. If you think Earth orbit is hard, Mars is an order of magnitude harder at least. Who's going to win? I can't make a call on that. I'll just tell you that, uh, that I'm glad to see the competition happening and may the best team win. And I would think overall, our mission to Mars is really benefiting us 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years down the road just because of everything that we're going to learn from all this competition. Well, just like it did in the 1960s when we went to the moon. Um, the technology that came out of that, we are still feeling that rolling repercussion of thunder that came from all the development work that went into going to the moon. If you like cell phones and you like the Weather Channel, you can thank the Apollo program because it helped drive an awful lot of that. And you can't even begin to imagine the technology that has to be developed to go do these things. You don't know where it'll play out. That's one of the great things. People come and they work on this stuff, they develop it, and then they say, okay, well that got done. I think I'll go out into private industry and this technology that I learned, this, this stuff that I learned, I'll spread that out. And that's where our tentacles from the space program reach out into every segment of society. So even if you're not going to Mars, you're still feeling you're the win. impact. <laughs> you're going to win. You got it. <laughs> well, thanks so much for joining us on Rocket Talk. For John Coward and our entire crew, I'm Bernie Gunther. We'll see you next time. Well, typically you have to come here to Kennedy Space Center to see the Mars rover, but it made a journey to the Super Bowl in Atlanta. Does that leave you to any jokes? <laughs> uh, so yeah, Marvin, yeah. the Mars rover model, uh, went up to the Super Bowl. Yeah, so in that context, I would have to ask you, if a football player gets athlete's foot, what does an astronaut get? I'm not sure. Mistletoe. <laughs> Feel free not to laugh at home. <laughs> <laughs>